Hi, this is Mike with episode 17 of Getting Everyone Moving, brought to you by Palms to Pines Parasports. And today we have a really special guest, Taylor Lipset, who is a Paralympian. And uh, thanks for being here, Taylor. Yeah, of course. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, so let's start off with how did you get started uh, playing sled hockey and, and with adaptive sports in general? Yeah, so I never played adaptive sports growing up. So I was diagnosed with a brittle bone disease when I was five. And the doctors basically pretty told, told us pretty early on that, you know, sports were just out of the picture because my bones were too fragile. And, you know, I was just too prone to getting injured. And so we didn't really pry into the adaptive sports world too much growing up. And then when I was 15, I ran into a lady at the grocery store that saw I was in a wheelchair and she came running up to me talking about sled hockey and the Paralympics, which I didn't know either, either one of those two things. Uh, I knew about wheelchair basketball, but that was about it. Um, and her son-in-law had just won gold at the 2002 Paralympic Games in, in Salt Lake City. And so um, she was telling me all about it and how, you know, her son-in-law won gold playing hockey and this and that. And I was a huge Stars fan. Uh, the Dallas Stars has won the cup in, in 99. And so, you know, we were still on that kind of high of uh, the Stars winning. And, and so uh, she gave me his contact information and I called him up, you know, over the next week and uh, went out and tried it out a week or two later. And I was, I was immediately hooked and it kind of took over my life from that point on. Well, yeah, I, I guess, you know, your family uh, and you were a bit cautious as you were growing up. Yeah. I mean, so what, what kind of support did you have to actually, you know, get out of that and say, hey, I'm going to do this? Yeah. So my parents never really told me that, that I couldn't do anything. Um, so like when I was growing up, I was riding around on a skateboard, you know, sitting down and um, using my hands to propel myself and going all over the place and, um, you know, playing football with my friends and street hockey. Um, somehow I always got put in the, in the goal when I was playing street hockey, because, you know, I was in a chair, so they just turned me sideways and no one could, could score on me very easily. Um, but, um, you know, really, you know, like I mentioned, we, we knew about wheelchair basketball and we had mentioned that to my doctor early on. And he was like, yeah, there's no way, like those guys flip over in their chairs. And if you do that, you're definitely going to break something. And so, you know, by the time I got introduced to sled hockey at 15, I kind of knew what my boundaries were and such. Um, and the first thing is that I didn't ask my doctor that time. <laughs> I just went out and tried it. Um, and I actually didn't tell my doctor that I was even playing until I made the, the national team and was getting ready to go to Sweden for the world championships and said, if I come back broken, this is why. Um, so just be prepared. <laughs> and so... Uh, that was kind of the start of it. <clears throat> oh, you have me cracking up here. That is amazing. <laughs> That's so great. So, you know, so you're 15, you start out playing. And then, I mean, how did you get to be an elite athlete? I mean, what did you have to go through in order to do that? Yeah, honestly, um, all that time I spent on a skateboard really helped me out um, when I transitioned to playing sled hockey, because if, if you watch sled hockey and if you imagine um, kind of scooting around on a skateboard, using your hands to propel yourself, it's the exact same motion. Um, and if you're sitting on a skateboard to turn, you're leaning side to side to turn yourself. And so those are the exact same muscle movements that you use in the sport of sled hockey. And so I was giving myself kind of a head start without even knowing it. And so once I transitioned to the ice, after I was introduced to the sport, like it was really second nature to me because I'd been doing that for many years as far as engaging those muscle groups and um, really, you know, being able to engage um, that muscle movement uh, and muscle memory. And so I progressed rather quickly, um, you know, fortunately from the time I was introduced in about April or May 2002, um, I was named to the national team just a year and a half later, um, right towards the end of 2003 going into uh, 2004. Um, and so it was a pretty quick progression. 
happen. Um, you know, once I did get named to the team, you know, obviously things changed and I had to start extra, you know, training on and off the ice. So it became much more involved once I was on the team. Uh, you couldn't just rely on, you know, natural ability um, at that point. And so that was a little bit of a shock early on in my career. But I really think that, you know, riding around on that skateboard for so many years really gave me the, the jump that I needed. <sighs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, how competitive is it, I mean, to get on the team in sled hockey? Are there... You know, are there a lot of people playing throughout the country? Tell us a little bit more about the sport. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's extremely competitive now. Back when I first started, not so much. You know, there was probably less than 10 teams, um, adult teams in the country and even less uh, youth teams in the country. Um, but today, you know, we've got well over 100 programs in the United States. Uh, many of them include youth and adult teams. Some are just youth, some are just adult, um, but definitely over 100 programs total. Um, and as far as, you know, players at that elite level that, you know, are, are trying to make a national team, um, when I first started, I think there was probably 20 to 25 players that, that tried out and 15 made it. So, you know, your chances were pretty good if you were in that upper level of, of players. Um, now there's at minimum 60 players that try out and at least I would say 30 to 35 of them have a quality shot at making the team any given year. Uh, the national team usually takes about 17 players. And then we've got a full-blown um, development national team now as well, which also takes 17 players. And those players can basically go up and down throughout a season if need be. Uh, if someone gets injured or if someone's not performing well, there's, there's essentially a whole team of players waiting to take someone's spot. And so, you know, it's extremely competitive now. Um, USA Hockey's done an amazing job of cultivating that talent over the years. Uh, we've got a invitation only development camp every summer that players from all over the country are invited to um, of, of all ages. You know, we've had players as young as 12 or 13, all the way up to, you know, players that are adults that were recently, you know, relatively recently introduced to the sport and are trying to take that next step. But, you know, it's, it's a place to really see all the talent that's up and coming in the nation um, and in one place. And then many of those players stay for the, the following weekend, which is the tryouts, which are held every year for that development team and the national team. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool that it's gotten so competitive. So is there a classification system similar to like, you know, wheelchair basketball? So there's not. <clears throat> and that's one of the unique things about sled hockey compared to most other adaptive sports. Um, that there's not a classification system. I know that IPC have, has been talking about that for a couple of years now, um, mostly because of the performance of the United States. And um, it just so happens that we've got a lot of double amputees on our, on our national team. Um, you know, and that's mostly a result of our country for better or worse, being involved in a war for so many years. And a lot of wounded veterans came back double amputees and got involved in, in sled hockey and progressed really well and really fast and made the national team. And so over the years, there's just been a, a you know, a concentration of double amputees in, um, you know, the United States playing the sport compared to other countries. Um, now, that doesn't mean you have to be a double amputee to be an elite athlete in sled hockey. Canada is a perfect example of that. I think they only have one or two double amputees uh, on their Paralympic team, and they played in essentially every gold medal game, um, you know, if you exclude 2010 when Japan beat them in the semifinals, they have essentially played in every gold medal game since I've been involved in the sport. So um, it's definitely not a, a prerequisite to, to do well in the sport. It just happens to be that the U.S. has a lot of double amputees, and so um, so a lot of the smaller countries are trying to push for that classification system to try to even the playing field a little bit, but it's just so complicated in hockey 
um, because, you know, players change on the fly. And so not only would the coaching staff have to be doing math in their head to figure out points, but all the referees on the ice would have to be figuring out uh, points of who's on the ice, who's off the ice and um, power plays, you know, you'd have to figure out power plays and penalty kills and it would just be very complicated. Um, but I, I do know it's something that, you know, they're looking at at, at, at some high level. Now you've played in the Paralympics. I mean, what, what is that experience like? I, mean, I can't imagine. Yeah, it's, it's unreal. You know, aside from winning the gold medal, um, the, the opening ceremonies of a Paralympic games is arguably the, like the coolest moments, you know, of my life, like going into a, the, the Paralympic stadium with your teammates and all the other athletes for your country and, every venue that I've been a part of has been completely sold out. Um, you know, we're talking tens and thousands of people cheering and, you know, they don't just cheer for their home country. They cheer for every country that's coming in. And there's always a huge theatrical performance around it, just like the Olympic games. And so just that rush and that feeling of entering the stadium to kick off the games is literally like the highlights of my life. Um, even without meddling, that is something that is so cool. And, and you know, like I said, one of the, the coolest things I've ever experienced. Um, and then, you know, then getting to compete and then actually compete in a, in a gold medal game or any medal game for that matter and, and bring home a, a medal for your country is, you know, an amazing experience and accomplishment. And, um, you know, you just think back of like all the people that, um, helped you get there, you know, like there's so many people like yourself that are involved in grassroots programs that, you know, try to introduce Paralympic sport to people um, throughout the country. Um, and so you think about those people, your family, and, you know, just everyone that helped you get there and in what you just achieved. And it, it's really a surreal experience and uh, everything finally coming together and, um, you know, realizing that dream and that goal that you had. That's amazing. And you're, you're still involved, you were telling me. Um, what, what are you doing now to promote the sport, you know, to get more people involved? Yeah, so here locally in the Dallas area, I'm still involved in the club program. Um, so we've got an adult program here in, in the area, as well as a small youth program uh, to, to get people involved in the sport. Um, and then at the national level, I'm on the USA Hockey Board of Directors and the Executive Committee. Um, so really just being that person that makes sure that sled hockey and uh, adaptive athletes have a voice at the table at the very highest level of USA hockey, making sure that our needs and goals are, you know, considered and being met as grassroots programs, but also as, you know, national and Paralympic uh, teams um, so that, you know, we can continue growing the sport across the country and continue winning gold medals at the highest level. Are there, I, I'm not aware of any collegiate level programs. Are there any right now? There's one um, and they've been around for a long time. So University of New Hampshire, New Hampshire. Um, they're, they're not called the UNH Wildcats, um, but they're, they're called the NEP Wildcats. And um, they've been, they've issued sled hockey scholarships to a handful of players over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, they attend school at UNH, um, they're treated, you know, like a, a college athlete. And then, like I said, they get to compete on that sled hockey team, which is one of the, the top tier level uh, sled hockey programs in the country. So players from all over the country uh, do and have gone there just to be able to participate on that team because they do get to train and compete, you know, as if they were on a collegiate team. But that's the only one that I know of. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to, we're trying to expand that and, you know, kind of get on the level of wheelchair basketball and track and field. Well, even, you know, a number of the people that I've interviewed, I've, I've asked them the question about how do we get more collegiate level adaptive sports? Because even if you look at wheelchair basketball, which is the most popular, there's, you know, it's a handful of schools, right. That have men and women's teams. So how, how do we go about, you know, getting more collegiate level adaptive sports, you know, whether it's hockey or basketball, I mean, wh what do we need to do so that, you know, really the youth that are 
playing throughout their entire lives, you know, have an opportunity to play at that level? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have the the right answer. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of it is is funding, right? You know, if if a, co if a college program is is funding an adaptive sport and issuing scholarships for athletes for an adaptive sport, that money has to come from somewhere. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, you you see this issue a lot with women's sport as well. Um, you know, women's sport programs getting cut, you know, because there's not funding for them. Uh, we've seen that in women's hockey, particularly uh, over recent years, even at some of the biggest hockey schools in the country. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of it is funding. Um, but, you know, a, in addition to that, a lot of it is still just education for the disabled community. Um, you know, coming from a sled hockey background, there's so many people, um, disabled people in the United States that don't even know about sled hockey. Um, and, you know, it's been in the United States since the late 90s. Uh, we've got arguably the, the most dominant Paralympic program in U.S. Paralympic history uh, that have won three gold medals in a row, four overall. And, um, you know, people still don't even know what the sport is. And so just continuing to educate the, you know, the public about adaptive sports, getting kids introduced to sports earlier, I think is key. You know, when I first started sled hockey, I was introduced to it as a teenager, like I said, and the, the guys that were introduced to it before me weren't introduced to it until they were adults. And so now we're finally getting into the point now where guys that are on the national team now were introduced to it as kids. And so we've seen that kind of, you know, generational effect and um, that's made a huge impact on the growth of the game around the country is just getting it introduced to people as early as possible. Um, and so, you know, I think as long as we keep educating, you know, the general public about Paralympic sport, uh, about the Paralympic movement, and, you know, people like yourself are engaged in their communities and establish parasport programs uh, to give kids and people the opportunity to participate, um, I think we'll continue to see that growth. Okay. So you have, you have a full family there. I, see. I do. Yeah, I probably see them coming in and out. Yeah, it's nonstop all the time. I see your, your daughter going in and out. Did you, you know, as you were growing up, right, you have this brittle bone disease, you're using a skateboard, you're using a wheelchair for mobility. Did you ever think that, you know, I'm not going to get married, I'm not going to have kids? Or did you always say, hey, I'm going to do this whole life? I didn't really think about the family side of things growing up. You know, I mean, to be honest, I never even thought really about the sport side of things until I was in high school. Um, kind of early on in my life, I, I committed myself in, in saying that I wanted to be a doctor. And so I spent my whole life growing up, you know, middle school, high school, going into college, you know, pursuing medical school. And then all of a sudden, you know, when I was a sophomore, junior in high school, was introduced to sled hockey and it derailed everything. Um, and so, you know, I did, I did enter college in a pre-med program um, and, you know, basically had to make a, a choice because it was uh, 2006, right after the Paralympic games in Torino. Mm -hmm. And I think I had like a, a three, six GPA, 3.6. And my advisor said, if you don't have a three, seven, five, like, you have no shot of getting into medical school. And so I was like, well, you know, I, I just started, you know, playing sled hockey at the highest level and I won a bronze medal, but I want to, you know, get a gold medal now. And so I switched majors. Um, but, um, you know, I didn't really think about it. And then in high school, you know, around the same time of getting introduced to sled hockey is when I met my wife. Um, and so we started dating in high school and, you know, once we actually started talking about having a family, I would say that started, you know, creeping up in my mind. And so I started doing a lot of research and things like that. And, uh, fortunately for my bone disease, there's, you know, in vitro fertilization and other scientific diagnostic testing and stuff that can be done to prevent passing it down because it is genetic. And so, you know, there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, thought and discussions with my wife and stuff um, around that as we started, you know, thinking about having a family. Uh, but fortunately, it's, it's all worked out. And, um, you know, we've got two beautiful 
uh, super noisy uh, little group <laughs> that keep us busy all the time. So do you, um, do you mentor, do you work with people who have been newly injured, you know, and help to motivate them? And I mean, what kinds of things do you say to people, you know, to get them moving again? Yeah, I haven't, I'll admit, I haven't been that involved with necessarily newly injured, um, you know, people, but you know, definitely a lot of mentoring with young kids that are involved in sled hockey programs. Um, you know, a lot of mentoring of Paralympic players, you know, by the time, you know, I was getting close to retirement in 2014, uh, even though I was, you know, only what, 27, 20, you know, 26 years old, I was considered the old guy on the team because it was my third Paralympic games. Um, and so by that point, I was mentoring some of the younger kids on the team, like the current captain, Josh Pauls, Declan Farmer. Um, and so, so I've definitely taken on that role as a mentor over the years, um, which I still try to do, um, you know, today, even though I'm not involved in the team, I keep in touch with many of the players and um, kind of act as a sounding board. You know, like I said, being a member of the USA Hockey Board of Directors, my, my title is an athlete director. So basically my job is to make sure that those guys have a voice. And so, you know, I try to make sure I keep that line of communication open uh, with a lot of those players to make sure, you know, I can keep tabs on, you know, what their experiences are and what's going well, what might not be going well, so that we can make sure that their needs and goals are being met. And so, you know, a lot of conversations and, and, and such around that. Um, and like I said, with, with kids locally that are involved in our programs uh, as well here. How, um, you know, so you've been someone, I mean, you've used a wheelchair for a number of years. Um, I mean, how, how do you think we create more inclusion um, in this country, you know, in your community? What, what do we have yeah. to do in order to do that? Yeah, I think a lot of it, again, comes back to just education. Um, you know, I think, and, and I, I'll admit that I was, uh, unfortunately, someone that had an, a horrible perception about people with disabilities when I was growing up, despite the fact that I was one. Um, I didn't have any disabled friends growing up. Uh, I was the only person I knew in a wheelchair. All my friends were able-bodied. Um, I think my parents asked me a couple of times if I wanted to go to like a disabled kids camp. And I always told them no, because, you know, I thought disabled people kind of sat around and felt sorry for themselves and, you know, didn't really have a lot to, to do or live for. Um, and so I was just trying to do everything I could to essentially be like, you know, my able-bodied friends and family members. Um, and it wasn't really until I was introduced to sled hockey that that perception was obviously corrected uh, quick, fast, and in a hurry, um, you know, and seeing what not only these athletes were able to do on the ice, but, you know, what these people did off the ice. You know, as you mentioned, a lot of us have families, you know, a lot of them had college degrees. Many of the ones here in Dallas that I had met early on had gold medals. Um, and so it just opened up this whole world to me that, you know, I had this horrible misconception about and not intentionally, it was just for whatever reason and assumption I had. Um, and so a lot of it is just continuing to educate our communities. Um, I think a, a lot of that is being done through not only like corporate um, diverse, diversity and inclusion programs, which I think is having a tremendous effect on um, educating people, not just with disabilities, but people that support people with disabilities. Or um, I know for my company, there's a number of people that aren't disabled um, that are just a part of it to learn. Um, and so that's been a great uh, thing. Another thing is just uh, coverage of adaptive sports. You know, we've seen NBC uh, stepping up huge over the past, you know, two to, th two to three Paralympic Games, just airing uh, the Paralympic Games and various sports and events. And that does wonders um, to re-educating people on what is possible for people with disabilities. And so I think as we continue to see that and we just continue to educate people and introduce people to the sport, um, you know, their, their mindsets change, the perceptions change. And like I said, as we introduce kids earlier to disabled sports, 
then their siblings' perceptions are automatically changed because they're all of a sudden subjected to a number of people with disabilities. Uh, their classmates' perceptions are changed because you know they're being educated on uh, you know, disabled sports or, or being around someone with a disability. So it, it really starts from the bottom and goes all the way to the top. And it's, it's just all around education and just changing people's perceptions, um, you know, as early as possible. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I admit that I was one of those people, but it's just being exposed to it that, you know, like I said, changed my life in an instant. Yeah. Isn't that, that's so interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, do you have, so we're getting close to the end of our podcast. Do you have any um, other words that you'd like to say to people or tell people? Yeah, you know, even as a adaptive athlete, you know, something that I, I really had to come to grips with and, and basically style my hockey career around was focusing on what I could do, not what I couldn't do. Mm-hmm. And obviously being an athlete with, brittle bones. Um, I was never going to be that athlete that was the hardest hitting, you know, hockey player. I wasn't going to be that enforcer on the team. You know, everyone thinks of hockey as, you know, grinding and hitting and, you know, checking people into the the walls. That was never going to be me because I, you know, just physically, I couldn't do that for risk of injury and taking myself out for the season. And so, you know, you know, Fairly early on, I accepted that and really focused on what I could do, not only, you know, on the ice, but what I could do off the ice to train to make myself better. And I I really focused on developing my puck handling skills and my shooting abilities. And in turn, my position on the team became being a goal scorer. So my team relied on me to score goals when I had the opportunity my guys that were on my line knew that they would go in, lay the checks, they would dig the puck out and then try to find me because they knew I would score. And so it, it allowed me to develop into that role player um, just by focusing on what I could do. Now, that, that doesn't just you know, pertain to sports, but just in life in general. So many people are so hard on themselves for, you know, the things that they can't do, you know, no matter what it is, whether it's related to their disability or not people are so hard on themselves. And if if we stop thinking about everything that we can't do and just focusing on what we can do and being the best at what we can do, I think it really changes, you know, people's mindsets. It changes people's attitudes. It changes people's perception of you as a person. Um, And and I think we can accomplish a a lot more that way. Well, Taylor, thank you so much. This has been just terrific. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Anytime. Thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, aside from uh, the noise and the cameos <laughs> and the children, um, you know, I was really excited to be a part of this and uh, can't wait to see more of what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thanks so much.